Hello, fellow BRS members. I want to welcome you all to our January club meeting. Tonight, we're hosting a Zoom meeting with none other than Bobby Miller, AKA Humblefish, the fish disease identification and treatment expert. We'd like to start by thanking you for coming on this Zoom meeting. It really is a nice way to entertain and educate all of our members during this time of uncertainty. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, man, I greatly appreciate it. So I'd like to start this meeting by reading a bio about Humblefish. So Bobby Miller, AKA Humblefish, has been in the saltwater aquarium hobby since 1978. Being in the hobby for so long has provided the opportunity to keep just about every type of marine system possible. In addition, Bobby has worked in retail, maintenance, and most re recently owned and operated Humblefish Aquatics, which sold quarantined conditioned saltwater fish. Around 15 years ago, Bobby decided to, vote to, uh, to devote himself to the fish disease and treatment aspect of our hobby, and this is considered his area of expertise. You can all go check out Bobby's forum, Humble Dog Fish, you know, a fish disease and treatment and identification forum. Um, I'll put the link in the chat so everybody can find that there. And you can also find the information on our forum as well. So I'd like to open it up to Mr. Humblefish. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to do a, a before we do q and I'd like to kind of do a very brief presentation and I'm going to try to share my screen here. Okay, and to that. Okay, let me, so let me just be sure everyone can still hear me and they're, they're seeing a screen that says humble.fish, how to tell the difference between ick and velvet and treatment options for both parasites, correct? Got it, yep. Yep. Okay, excellent. Okay, so first thing I think everyone, I mean, some people know this, some people don't, is when you see white dots on a fish, you know, ick or velvet, you're not actually seeing uh, the parasites. The parasites, most parasites are, are microscopic and cannot be seen with the naked eye. So what you're actually seeing, the white dots are actually the fish's immune response to the parasites. So when a fish is, is attacked by parasites, it releases um, uh, its immune response it builds up excess mucus around the parasite to, it, that's the defense mechanism that the fish has against the parasites. So it can velvet, a lot of people kind of confuse them. You know, they don't know the difference between them. And to me, it's extremely important to know what you're dealing with because ick is a far less virulent parasite than velvet. Uh, you know, we, we probably all know people, some of us here probably even manage ick in our DT. There, there's a lot of different uh, uh, management tools to do that. But velvet is a different animal because it basically can wipe out your tank. It, it can kill all of your fish in a matter of just a few days. Um, the reason for this is because velvet, uh, the numbers, it's a numbers game. So we're with ick, and we're going to get to this. Let's actually go to the first thing about marine ick. So this is kind of what you need to know, kind of a rundown on marine ick. So it's a mild parasite, which is often managed by using a UV sterilizer, ozone, diatom filter, oxidator, herbal remedies, enhanced nutrition. It can be treated in a quarantine tank using hyposalinity, chloroquine, copper, or tank transfer method. The, if you have ick in your tank and you treat it in a quarantine tank, your display tank, once it's gone fallow or fishless, the standard fallow period is 76 days. However, new research just last year uh, suggests that raising aquarium temperature to uh, 27 degrees Celsius, which is 80.6 degrees Fahrenheit, can shorten the ick fallow period to just six weeks. So the primary symptom of ick is salt or sugar-like sprinkles on the body and fins. And as you can see here, we have a hippo tang with ick. And it's oval shaped white dots can usually be counted. These remain on the fish for three to seven days before dropping off to continue their life cycle. So if you look at this fish here, you know, if you actually took the time, you could actually count the number of white dots on the fish. So that, that is one way you can tell it's ick because with ick, you can usually count the number of white dots. Uh, the white dots are, are larger because the parasite, the ick parasite, the, the trophon, which feeds on the fish is larger. So you have larger, um, white excess mucus which forms around the trophons. 
Here is a, another uh, picture I've got of a, of a Coley Tang with ick. Again, you can kind of notice that if you took the time, you could actually count the white dots and you can see that they're, they're larger. Now, the reason that most fish are able to survive uh, an ick outbreak is the number of parasites. What, what you're looking at right here is something that most fish via their natural immune system can survive this because it's, it's a number that they can deal with. When we get to velvet, you're gonna see the difference. You're gonna see why fish are more likely to succumb to velvet. And before we get to that, okay, so this just basically gives you like a rundown on the, uh, the life cycle of, of ick. So basically, if, it, if you look at the little, the diagram kind of goes in reverse. So basically, when a fish has ick, which is called the trophonts on the fish, um, the trophonts will drop off and within 18 hours, they crawl around, it's called the protomont stage, and they look for a hard surface to insist upon. It can be rock, it can be sand, it can be glass, it can be plastic. There's all kind of materials that a protomont can insist upon. Once it finds a suitable place to insist, it, in, it will insist, it will protect itself. The, the cyst is like a protective layer which protects it from chemicals and hyposalinity. And then it spends three to 28 days on average on the substrate. And then it, at that point, begins to release free swimmers into the water that are able to survive roughly for 24 hours. And what the free swimmers are looking for, they're called uh, therons, they're looking for a host to continue their life cycle. So they're looking for a fish. And you can kind of see how this kind of, it's a never ending cycle. As long as you have ick and as long as you have fish, for the most part, you're gonna have this never ending cycle of the parasites dropping off, reproducing, and then reinfecting the fish. Okay, so now we're gonna to get to marine velvet disease. And we talked about ick and we said, you know, ick is, is mostly manageable because it's, the, it's a numbers game. The fish can handle the number of, of, of ick trophonts that are on it. Velvet is a different animal. De velvet is a far more dangerous pathogen. Uh, like I've said before, it can kill your fish in 24 to 48 hours. Some fish last longer. So it's a fast killing parasite capable of wiping out most of your fish in just a matter of days. It can be treated in a quarantine tank using chloroquine or copper. Um, it's very important if you have a fish with velvet, and this is a step you don't usually have to take with ick, but with velvet, it's very important to provide the fish with temporary relief because copper does not actually kill the parasites on the fish. All copper does is protect the fish from reinfection. Copper will eradicate the free swimmers before they can, they can attach, uh, attack the fish again. So to provide, there, there's a number of ways to provide temporary relief, but one of the ways I've developed is you give the fish a five minute freshwater dip, followed by a 90 minute bath using acloflavin. There's a product called Ruby Reef Rally, which contains acloflavin, which is a good product to use. You can also use a 45 minute formalin bath or a method I've developed just recently is a 30 minute hydrogen peroxide bath. All of these can be used to provide the fish with temporary relief. So basically what you're doing by, when I, when I say temporary relief, you're knocking off most of the parasites, most of the trophons that are on the fish before the fish goes into copper and then copper will protect your fish from reinfection. Um, if, you, if you have velvet in your tank, and you should treat it, you should do it ASAP. It's, it's, it's timing is of the essence. Um, you don't, with ick, you have a lot more time to decide what you're going to do, but velvet is, is a potential tank killer and you wanna take action immediately. The fallow period for velvet is six weeks. So velvet is also interesting because in addition to the white dots, which we're gonna see in a moment, it also has some unique uh, behavioral symptoms. So symptoms of velvet include swimming into the flow of a power head or a wave maker. Um, and you'll see the tiny white dots, we'll see that in a minute. Also, a lot of times, um, if a fish has velvet, they'll be they'll act reclusive. They'll stay out of the light because velvet makes uh, fish sensitive to light. So if you have fish that are kind of not coming out, um, there's a possibility they could have velvet. Um, and again, we're kind of back to if you can count the white dots, it's usually ick. However, if the white dots are too numerous to count, there's a good chance you're dealing with velvet. And we're going to see some pictures. So here's a... Here's a, and I've got several pictures, but here's again, here's a hippo tang with velvet. So it's smaller round white dots, oftentimes completely covering the fish and too numerous to be counted. Uh, these remain on the fish for 12 to four hours before dropping off. So on this hippo tang here, you can see um, 
you can see like if you look closely you can see the white dots and here yeah, there's actually a maybe a better one here now you, you see how that purple tang is just covered i mean you know it you really i mean you sat there you really couldn't count the number of white dots and you see how much smaller those white dots are on this purple tang than what we were looking at before with ick so that's how you can tell the difference one waves of between Belden and Nick. And I'll kind of back up here. Hey, Bobby, quick question with that. You know, sometimes I've read your stuff that says under the skin, above the skin type deal. Is there a difference between Ick and, and Belvin in terms of where it, where it shows or how it shows? So Ick, okay, so velvet will usually appear to be just on the surface of the scales, whereas Ick actually, Ick actually embeds a little bit deeper. So it will appear, the white bumps will appear to be just under the outer skin layer, if that makes sense. Because velvet is more what I call a surface parasite. So you'll actually see the white dots just on the very top of, 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 the, of the skin. Whereas, like I said, it actually burrows in and actually under the outer skin layer. So you kind of see like a bump if that answers your question, which is like, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, why not just get a cleaner shrimp or a cleaner wrasse and well, I mean, yeah, they, they will eat um, surface parasites like brook and velvet and flukes, but they can't get ick because ick just burrows in out of reach for them, basically. If that answers your question. So are you, yeah. able, to, are you able to see this uh, long nose butterfly? Yes. yes. Okay, so they, again, you know, if you look at the white dots on here and you can see how, how small they are, now, what's interesting about this is because this long-nosed butterfly is a, um, a light-colored fish, the white dots are not as visible on, on the body as when we were looking at the purple tang and the, and the hippo tang. But you can still see it on the dark areas, and you can see it like on the fins, especially on the tail fin. So, you know, a lot of people, I tell people, if you're, you're quarantining a light-colored fish, like a yellow tang or a long-nosed butterfly or something like that, Definitely keep an eye on the fish's fins um, because that's if you the fish is going to have ichor velvet, that's where it's going to pop up. Okay, Bobby, can you talk a little bit about like lympho and like like so? I've got a copper band that's had it day one. You know, treated, went through it, nothing changed. Um, kind of looks like ick and 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 velvet, but I'm pretty comfortable at this point in time that it's it's not and it's lympho. So lympho actually, um, and actually when I get done with this, I can actually pull up a picture of lympho from my website. So lympho a lot of times will start out looking like ick. It will start out looking like a little white nodule, like a little white growth. Like usually it's on the fins though. And the way you can tell the difference between um, ick and lympho is lymphocystis, it, 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 it's, a, it's a virus. And what you're seeing is a white nodule, which is actually the fish has a virus living inside its body and that's the symptom is the white nodule. Ick will stay on a fish for seven days maximum and then drop off. So the white spot will disappear. Lympho usually lasts about at least a couple of weeks before the nodules begin to disappear. So if you're seeing a white dot on a fish and it's been there for more than seven days, there's a good chance it's not ick. You're actually, you're, uh, you're, you're dealing with lymphocystis. Um, and unlike ick lymphocystis, um, there, there's no known treatment or cures for viruses in fish. All you can do is uh, basically feed uh, vitamin-soaked foods to, to send the virus back into remission. Um, actually, beta-glucan um, is actually a very good um, um, supplement you can add to the food to, um, to put the virus back into um, um, uh, remission. Um, so that's, yeah. So yeah, but yeah, a lot of people, and I'd say a lot of times if a fish has ick, you're going to at least see probably half a dozen or more white dots. A lot of times lympho will start out as just one dot. It gets bigger. It gets larger. Um, it's why it, when it grows in size, it's actually called cauliflower disease. Some people call it because of the size difference. But when I get through with this, I can actually pull up on my website um, some pictures of lympho for everyone to see. Okay. Um, Okay, so this basically running through it, this is the, uh, the life cycle of velvet. Um, the trophon is what you see actually on the skin. That's actually the feeding stage of the parasite. You'll kind of see like a little bit of a picture of the trophons and the gills. Um, the, it's the same, it's a basically the same life cycle as ick, it's just faster. Uh, the, the trophon drops off, becomes a protomont. The tomont is the insisted stage, which is basically like the egg stage. Um, a little bit different in languages um, with ick, the free swimmers are called therons. 
with um, um, velvet. The free swimmers are called dinospores because velvet is actually a dinoflagellate, so it's why they call them dinospores. Um, another interesting thing about velvet, and this is again why velvet is so much more virulent than ick, each dinospore can actually release, I'm sorry, each velvet tomon can release up to 200 free swimmers. So that's kind of where we're back to why velvet is so much more dangerous than ick. It's a numbers game. You know, each tomon releasing 200 free swimmers into the water, which can potentially infect fish, that's usually too much for a fish's immune system to handle, especially if the free swimmers, if the parasites get into the gills and basically suffocate the fish to death, which is really in most cases, I would say with both ick and velvet, it's not the trophons that are on the body that kills the fish, it's the trophons that you don't see which are inside the fish's gills that you know, the fish starts breathing heavy and suffocates the fish to death. Okay, so run real quick. So basically, if you've, you've got ick or velvet in your DT and you wanna treat, well, you have to set up a quarantine tank. So it's just kind of a quick rundown. Um, the bare essentials is obviously an aquarium. You need a heater and a thermometer, a small power head or a, a air pump and sponge filter or an air stone for additional circulation and gas exchange. And you need at least to use freshly mixed salt water, which has been fully dissolved and circulating for at least uh, 24 hours. I don't advocate, if possible, using DT water to set up your quarantine tank because obviously there's gonna be free swimmers already in that water, so you're just adding more parasites. It actually does the fish a lot, of, a lot of good to get out of that into a tank with freshly mixed salt water to give them a clean slate as you're raising copper. Um, a light is optional. A hang on back filter is, is good, but it's optional. You want um, egg crate to use as a, or something to use as a lid so the fish doesn't jump out. Uh, if you can see the picture of the PVC elbows, those are, can be used for hiding spots. And I also like using a CCAM ammonia alert badge for um, active monitoring because ammonia is probably the number one killer of fish in a, in a quarantine tank. And this is just a picture of, I mean, this is one way to set up a quarantine tank. You can kind of see the tank and you can see the heater and the thermometer and a um, uh, air-driven sponge filter. I mean, this is something you can, anybody can do really quickly on the fly. You know, if you've got fish dropping left and right um, from velvet, this is something you could set up quickly and treat your fish. The downside is this, um, unless you see that sponge, is, there's gonna be no biological filtration. So you're going to want to um, have to stay on top of the ammonia and do water changes to control that. This is a little bit, this is a more elaborate quarantine tank. This is probably what most of us use. You can see the hang on back filter in the back. Um, and you can see uh, there's a wave maker over on the right. And the nice thing about using a hang on back filter uh, for quarantine is you're actually able to put biomedia in the filter. You, know, you can use a sponge or there's, there's inert uh, biomedia that you can use and you can seed with the bacteria in a bottle product to give you a biological filtration in QT to help control the ammonia. Because again, that's the biggest, probably number one killer is ammonia in QT. Okay, and how do you treat it and velvet? So there are a lot of different ways to do it, but I would say for most people, the easiest ways to treat with copper is a tried and true method. Um, I prefer this product, Copper Power, just because it's, it's been the most consistent for me over the years. Uh, with copper power, fish can be dropped in at one parts per million, and then you can slowly or gradually raise the copper level over four to five days. And once you get it up to at least 2.0, between 2.0 and 2.5, if you're uh, treating in one tank, you would treat for 30 days. Um, and, and this is kind of a thing with copper. A lot of people use copper and they kill fish with copper, and I feel the reason they do that is because they don't slowly, gradually raise the copper level. And what I mean by that is, you know, if, if your schedule can allow for this, you know, you know, take a, like a syringe and four or five times a day, just add very, very, very small quantities of copper to very, very slowly raise the copper level on the fish because it is a poison and the fish don't like it. And the only hope you can really have for the fish to tolerate the treatment is if they're just very slowly and gradually exposed to it and basically what it comes down to is you're basically hoping the fish can last longer in copper than the parasites can. That's basically how it works. I mean, I'll say that, you know, my, what, what I've seen here is, you know, as you raise from one to two to 2.5, 
you know, you start to see if your fish stop eating, right? So as you're progressing along there at the fish stop eating, then you got to back off a bit. But if you can get to that two, 2.5 area and the fish are still eating, I've had good success with, with a lot of fish making it fully through that as long as they continue to kind of eat and don't go hiding kind of through that one to 2.5 process. Exactly. And, you know, sometimes what will happen is, you know, as you're raising the copper level, I mean, you'll, you might just have a fish or two that they're just not eating as well or they stop eating altogether. And I tell people, don't be afraid to back it off a little bit. You know, maybe if you're at, you know, because technically 1.5 is technically therapeutic, but I like to treat between 2 and 2.5. So if you, you know, if you hit 2 and the fish maybe aren't eating at all anymore, do some water changes, lower the copper level back down to 1.75 or 1.5, get the fish eating again, and then try again, and then slowly raise it back up. And a lot of times with that, that second try, they'll tolerate it better and they'll continue eating for the duration of the treatment. Um, so another important thing with copper, you know, used to be back in the old days, we had to use, um, you know, like the liquid test kits, you know, we're sitting here reading test strips and, you know, trying to read the colors. Well, now we have the HANA high range copper checker um, that just you can do a test and it prints out a little number and the it's accurate within 0 0.05 ppm um, it's a godsend for to me because it's just so much easier to keep tabs on your copper level um, if you do buy one of these I, I tell people make sure you order extra reagents because I think it only comes with like three or four reagents um, and I think the reagents are like uh, 25 like ten dollars for a 25 pack or something like that and I highly advocate testing your copper level daily um, to make sure that the copper level is staying therapeutic at all times because if it drops below therapeutic, then you have to restart um, the clock on that. Okay, and then here I'll, uh, since we have it on screen share, let me see if I can pull up uh, on my website. Yeah, Bobby, I, I have, I have a, a, a hand of meter if anyone wants to use it, you know, a lot of reagent and I have the meter as well, so, and, and I'm done using it, so. Happy to let anyone in the club use that if they need. That'd be awesome. You could be the, the copper checker guy for the whole club. <laughs> no, I'll be the <laughs> copper sender tester to folks, but uh, yeah, no, I'm. Uh, yeah, I have one as well, guys. So if anyone needs it, let me know. Yeah. I, I buy from uh, from Mike, Quarantine US anymore, Bobby. Yeah, that's what, that's, I, 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 I went and uh, QT'd a whole bunch of them, and from here on out, it's only a one ever here and there. So I just, I just buy from your vendors now. Awesome. So can everyone see the, the, uh, the fish with the limpo? Yep. Okay. So this is like, we were, um, uh, Brian brought up about lymphocystis and how it can look like it. So I just wanted to, you know, on this. So basically in, in, it seems like angels and butterflies seem to be more prone to this virus than any other fish I've ever seen, but you can kind of see here, we'll kind of scroll through the pictures. And you can kind of see how like, they've got the white, the white growths. They're mostly on the fins. Um, there's a Lamarck with it right there. You can see it. And then this, this juvenile uh, emperor, you can see on the tail, it's really bad. And it doesn't always start out that bad. I mean, a lot of times lympho will start out as just a single, you know, one or two little white dots. It's usually on the, on the edge of the fins. And you're like, oh, my fish had Vic. Well, you know, maybe just give it a few days. And what's going to happen is if it's lymphocystis, the, these nodules, these white nodules are going to grow in size. And that's how you know you're dealing with uh, lymphocystis. Here's a, 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 it's either a blue or a clean angel with it. Um, so I guess the, the moral of the story here is not all white dots are, are ick or velvet, are parasites. Or, I mean, sometimes it can be a, a viral growth or bacterial tufts. I mean, um, so yeah, that's why I tell people, if in doubt, you know, come over to my forum and, and ask a question, post some photos, and we'll definitely try to help you figure out what you got going on. Okay. Oh, all right. So I guess we can just open it up for Q&A at this point. Uh, any questions? Dun, dun, dun. I'll go first. Um, so... Some of us, you know, as we're buying fish at the, uh, at the store, you know, some of these fish we bring home and they're so sensitive, they're not eating. Um, and we're going to go right into quarantine with them. Um, any advice on that, I guess? I mean, I've had some fish that don't eat for, you know, the first three or four days. Maybe some, sometimes they don't even make it. Stop. So, I mean, so 
when they're not eating, are you are you immediately treating them with medications, or are you just putting them in quarantine and and with no medications and not eating? Uh, I haven't I haven't used the quarantine yet, um, but I wanted to you know start start doing that. Um, I'm I'm just adding up a second tank here, um, so I just kind of wanted to do it right. But I I know in the past buying some fish at the store, um, you know some of them don't eat for a while. So what I, what I like to do to look over the fish and decide which one you want. Hey, Bobby, can you talk like quickly just about the aspect of going fallow, but potentially not going fallow if you have areas of kind of no air in the tank and like what we can do to potentially mix the salt and mix the substrate up to an extent to make sure that you're truly going fallow versus assuming you're going fallow? Yeah, so there was a study a few years ago where they actually found um, ictomones actually could go dormant for, I think it was up to six or seven months or longer in areas, which I think they call them hypoxic regions, um, which those would be areas of, of, of little, little to no oxygen. So if you think about our aquariums, you know, we have a lot of pie nooks and crannies um, in our display tank in our aquariums that are probably um, low to no oxygen areas. So anaerobic regions or hypoxic regions of the tank. I mean, I can think like you said, the sand, especially if you have a deep sand bed, um, probably underneath that sand, there's gonna be areas where there's little to no oxygen. You have really large rocks in the tank, you know, probably in the very center of those rocks are gonna be areas that don't get flow and they're not gonna get oxygen. Um, I think sometimes certain reactors, canister filters um, can be, have, have anaerobic uh, regions to it. So you definitely, when you're going fallow, you want to, um, you want to basically stir those areas up. So, you know, if you're going fallow, you want to go in there, you can actually buy these, um, it's meant for gravel, but you can use them for sand. It's basically like a vacuum. Maybe when you're doing your water change, kind of get in there and, 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 and um, stir your sand up, vacuum the sand up. Um, I would also advocate like if you have really large rocks in your tank, take like a, like a power head, one with the, like one of those um, Aquaclear power heads that have like a jet nozzle, shoot all your rocks. So you're, you're infusing oxygen into those areas. If you have any reactors, you probably want to take them all offline, clean them, sterilize them, reuse them if you're using a canister filter. Canister filters are notorious for having um, um, anaerobic uh, regions. I would take that, clean it, sterilize it, and reuse it. So Probably could, you'll, you'll read about a lot of people saying, hey, what happened? I went, you know, two, three months or longer, fallow, it failed. What did I do wrong? I took all the fish out. And I think that's probably the reason why is because there's these areas in your tank that have little to no oxygen where the tow months are actually going dormant. And then at some point in the future, they wake up, you know, maybe you increase the flow or something in your tank and then they start releasing free swimmers and infect your fish. And I know, Bobby, you guys have done a lot of work trying to figure out like the use case for hydrogen peroxide kind of in the tank. Um, I don't know, you able to talk a little bit about kind of what your preference is on kind of how and when to use it. I know that you guys talk about using it as a, as a bath prior to QT um, and so forth. So just a little bit on that. So me personally, I'm, I'm doing most of my research into using hydrogen peroxide as a, um, as a 30 minute bath. I mean, there's on my website and form, there's directions on step by step how to do it. Um, you basically, what you do is you take uh, uh, oxygenated salt water and you, you mix hydrogen peroxide in there and being, you know, hydrogen peroxide is an oxidizing agent, it's a bleaching agent. It actually is able to kill most, if not all, parasites on a fish. Now, the million dollar question is, this 30 minute bath, is it capable of 100% eradication or you know, are some parasites still lingering on a, um, a quarantine method for eliminating ick? And then we are employing two hydrogen peroxide baths that are six days apart um, to also treat velvet, brook, and other diseases. And the, the two baths six days apart is actually scientists, it's, it's based on, on a, uh, a peer reviewed article where they actually took, um, I forget which fish it was, it might've been like sea drums or something. And these, they had velvet, they did the 30 minute peroxide bath and 150 PPM. 
and they afterwards examined, you know, did uh, skin and gill scrapes and gill clippings, and they saw that after one peroxide bath that the, um, the language they used in the, in the article was the number of trophons were greatly reduced. When they did a second peroxide bath on these same fish six days later, there was no more detectable trophons on the fish. So to me, that was exciting because I'm like, well, we already, when we do tank transfer method, we're already transferring the fish every three days anyway. So why don't we just um, incorporate hydrogen peroxide into this where we're doing 30 minutes before uh, two transfers six days apart, we, we treat with hydrogen peroxide to cover a wider array of diseases. And on my forum, there's, I call it clinical trials, and there's people that are, that have been using this and they're experimenting with it. And so far, so good. I mean, I haven't really seen, um, there's always going to be questions and possible failures, but it seems like the vast majority of people that are using it are, are, are having success. Um, so there's also this lady on my forum, her name is Jessica. We talked about Jessica earlier, and she's actually kind of going a different direction with it, which she's actually doing is she is dosing peroxide directly into her display tank. And a lot of people I know use this already to combat nuisance algae, but she is dosing, I think it's like one milliliter per eight gallons or per 10 gallons. She's dosing it into the water every eight hours. She's using a UV sterilizer to increase the efficacy of the treatment. And it's actually turning out to be a reef safe treatment for uh, treating velvet brook and other diseases in a DT environment. Now I will say there have been successes and there have been failures with it. So it, it does seem kind of like it's a thing that maybe it works sometimes, it doesn't work other times. Um, we don't really know how long peroxide stays active. Um, you know, when we do the bath, it's a static bath, but we don't know how long peroxide really stays active in the water when you're dosing it into a DT with the flow and light and all those other factors. But uh, I mean, I would say for someone that's, uh, you know, like, hey, I'm just not going to quarantine uh, I, and, and I've got velvet in my tank and it's killing all my fish. I think that, I mean, I'd give it a shot before I would just do nothing, you know, the in-tank peroxide dosing. Yeah, my wife, she's listening to me. It kind of, we've kind of found that if you catch it early enough, then it seems like the in-tank peroxide dosing is a lot more effective than, you know, you're, you're, you know, so you see like maybe a few fish, whereas we've had people who are like, all my fish are covered in velvet, the fish are dropping like flies, they try yeah. the peroxide treatment, it doesn't work. Well, the fish are probably too far gone to be saved anyway. Bobby, when you, when you look at that, like when, when you do the bath, do you do the bath prior to the tank transfer? So if you're going from tank A to tank B, do you do the bath after like tank A before it goes into tank B? So does it like knock off all of this stuff or does it kill the stuff? It actually, what we've seen with velvet in particular is it actually makes the trophons explode. Mm -hmm. So if you actually, um, there's actually one of the vendors actually did kind of a before and after and before and after. And what he saw was viable trophons, velvet trophons on a fish prior to a, a hydrogen peroxide bath. He ran them, uh, the fish with velvet through the 30 minute peroxide bath and then took gill clippings and examined them. And actually, it actually looks like, it looks like the trophon is splattered. So the trophon is actually still attached, but it's no longer viable. It's basically dead. It's just basically exploded on the fish and it will, I mean, eventually detach and fall off. Um, so, and, th and that's kind of the reason where, again, we're back to with, vel with, with peroxide. It's probably more effective against, again, we're back to surface parasites, velvet and brook, maybe flukes, because the peroxide can actually get to the trophons or to the parasites and kill them, where again, ick is so difficult to, to eradicate because it burrows under the outer skin layer, which again, is probably out of reach for the, for the peroxide. But I mean, you can do it either way. You can actually do, you can actually like in a, I, I use like a jar, like a two gallon glass jar. I do the peroxide bath, or if you're doing tank transfer method anyway, 30 minutes before the transfer, discontinue all aeration, dose the peroxide right in the tank, do the 30 minute bath right in the tank, transfer the fish into tank B, and then tank, take tank A and sterilize it in, you know, in anticipation for the next peroxide bath. I mean, for the next tank transfer. I got one more question if uh, no one else has others. Is anyone else have anything else I want to ask? 
Somebody's got to have some questions. <laughs> hey, even if, let me, I'll just throw this out there. Even if you don't believe in quarantining, uh, uh, for 30 years, I didn't quarantine. I managed to do this for 30 years. So even if you have a question about that is not specific to quarantine, I might be able to help with that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I've been dealing with a, a fish that I I bought some clownfish in June, and then I realized that the male had some weird kind of a glaze thingy on it. So I start freaking. It's Brooks. It's Brooks. So I treated. I did the acriflavin thingy and everything, and then after that the metro and it was fine, and I put it back. But then around December he start having some swish again, and then I start seeing that the hole that I thought in his head was like something congenital was come bigger and bigger. So I said, okay, that's hole in the head disease, probably. Mm -hmm. So now my question: it's probably it's gonna be okay, I guess, in a few weeks, and then it's gonna probably come back. So is that like? an immunodeficiency that's going to be transmitted to his offspring when they're going to be ready to um, to lay? Should I scrape the fish? Because it's happy, it's eating. I mean, he loves life. So I'm like, I don't want to kill it, but I don't want to have it reproduce and give some immunodeficiency to, you know, its progeny. So, um, so hole in the head disease, which is where, so hole in the head which is different from hle hole in the head is actually when they have like the little like it looks like a little hole um near their sensory organs um so that is actually caused by an internal flagellate um so if the fish actually has um hole in the head disease you'll also you'll also see white stringy feces because the flagellates you don't see that at all because the flagellates actually start out in the intestines and then they migrate to the sensory pores and then they try to burrow out, which is why you're seeing the white hole. Um, if you're not seeing white stringy feces, it, it could be something else. It could be like maybe an infection, like a bacterial infection, or if you're just seeing possible, like, which is unusual for a clownfish to have HLE, but if it actually looks like maybe the skin is, is sort of rotting a little bit, then that um, is a different condition called HLE which is actually more of a condition than a disease. Um, and it can be caused by, there's a number of things. It can be caused by stray voltage in the water. It can be caused by carbon dust, or it can be caused by, what was the other thing? Cop yeah, and it can be a nutritional deficiency as well that causes it. Um, a lot of times tangs will get it, and then once you start feeding them nori, it, it goes away. Um, but unless you're seeing white stringy feces, I. I wouldn't, I don't think it's hole in the head. I think it's something else. Okay. Yeah, and in and, and hole in the head disease, it's it's pretty virulent. That that will take a clownfish down within a few weeks. So if they've had this for a while, um, I would say something else. What you can do is come on my forum, post uh, some photos maybe, and we can okay. kind of help you diagnose it to figure out what it is. I try, it's mostly gone now that I mean, you have to check on the blue light and see that there's like a little piece of the glazy stuff, but it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be gone and I will put it back with his lady and it's gonna come back in five months, I guess, or it's right. weird. Yeah, it, it's not hole in the head then because fish don't recover from hole in the head without, um, you usually have to food soak Metro um, to get it to, to kill the internal parasites, the internal flagellates to get it to go away. It, it could be something else, could be a bacterial infection, could be HLLE, um, but I don't think it's hole in the head disease based on okay. what you're telling me. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hey Bobby, um, you talked about the fallow, right? So during a fallow period, uh, can a, a critter or an invert in the tank be a host to the parasite? It, so yes and no. So corals and inverts can host the tomone stage. Um, so yes, they can be a host. And so basically what I'm saying is that if you were to take a coral in, or an invert from your DT and put it into like, say you have a friend and you're going to sell him a coral fragment, yeah, you can infect his tank. But the, the reason going fallow works is in order for, for the parasites, for um, all parasites to complete, you know, fish parasites to complete their life cycle, they have to have a fish host to feed on. And when you deny them that, then the, the parasite will reach a point in its life cycle where it's like, okay, I'm free swimming, I'm looking for food, I need to feed so I can then continue my life cycle. Once they are unable to find a fish host, 
they literally starve to death because you know no nutrition they can't reproduce so you 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 technically corals and inverts technically do host um it can velvet because there's the tome up stage which can insist upon them but it's not like it, it's like an egg on them it's not like actually like damaging them like when you have trophants on a fish got it thank you you're welcome Bobby, I think some of the stuff that you guys have out there says that speeding up the life cycle via higher temperatures kind of is a correlation. Is that something that you fully believe in or is it something that just um, what I would say other papers have, have shown to, to, to be true? So it, it's, it's well documented in freshwater that um, parasites, freshwater parasites, the life cycle speeds up in warmer water and slows down in cooler water temperatures. Now, so far, I've always suspected that is the case um, with, with saltwater parasites, but there was, it was just anecdotal. There was no evidence to support it. So as of last year, we now have a study, and it's only one study, but it's been peer reviewed. And they, in the study, they, they proved that um, I actually up to 86 degrees Fahrenheit the fallow period's only two weeks. So the, the warmer the temperature is, the increases the life cycle, at least ick, this was only done on ick, it wasn't done on any other parasites. And when you, um, when you lower the temperature, like if you get the temperature closer to 70 degrees Fahrenheit or below, actually ick can, uh, ick trophons can stay on a fish longer than seven days. I think it was like nine to 10 days. Um, so, I mean, I'm pretty comfortable with it. I mean, it's just one study. It was peer reviewed. Um, so I'm pretty comfortable thinking, I, yeah, I think, it's, I think that's the case. I think it's uh, something we've always suspected and I think it's been confirmed now. So I, I like the 80.6 temperature because I think that doesn't kill anything you know, in the tank, whether it's coral wise, bacteria wise, fish wise, you know, but you said it kind of just applies to ick. What about like urinoma and, you know, velvet and all the other stuff? It's like, should you kind of be comfortable with this kind of 45 day time frame at, at 80.6? Yeah, because well, well velvet, um, being velvet naturally just has a faster life cycle. Uh, six weeks was always fallow for velvet even before um, this study. So, I mean, that's why I like the six weeks because it also addresses um, uh, velvet. Brooke, the, um, the so other some other parasites I can think of. Brook has only a four week because it has a direct life cycle, no insisted stage. Brook is only a four week fallow period. Flukes are only a four week fallow, fallow period. Um, the uranema is a problem because there is no fallow period because uranema can actually subsist off of uh, bacteria, detritus. Unfortunately, once you get uranema in your tank, um, some people seem to beat it if they keep their tank really really clean. Um, but it seems in a lot of cases, if you have uranema in your tank, I mean, there's, there's no fallow period. You can't get rid of it. The good thing about uranema is it seems to be a species specific, uh, pathogen. So obviously everybody knows chromis damsels are very prone to uranema. Um, there are other fish that are prone to uranema, um, antheus, angelfish, butterfly fish, but usually only at high concentration. So really what I tell people is like, look, you know you got your name in your tank just don't ever buy chromos damsels you just can't have that fish keep your tank very clean um, eliminate the feeding grounds you know no detritus and you're eliminating the feeding grounds for the parasites odds are you can probably still put antheus and butterflies and angels in your tank and they're probably not gonna uh, uh, their immune systems gonna be able to keep your name at bay unless you know you get a little lazy and the tank gets dirty and it kind of fuels an outbreak because that's, really that's really what it comes down to with all parasites. It's like if, if the number of parasites in your tank are kept at a sublethal concentration and it's something that the fish's natural immune system, I mean, these, these fish have immune systems. And if their immune systems can cope with it, they're fine. It, the problem is when the number of parasites that is, are so many that it overwhelms the fish's immune system. And then a lot of times if a fish has a parasitic infestation, and the next thing it pops up is a bacterial infection. It's just, it's just too much. It's, it's, it's uh, just too much for them to deal with. Yeah, I remember reading Paul Beast at one time. Like I've been diving numerous times, and I've never saw a fish with ick, never saw a fish sick. You know? So I think it, it li likely is kind of contained to our tanks. And 
you know, that, that overrunning aspect of stuff is probably what is, is, is the majority of what takes our fish down. I mean, you think about it, in the ocean, there's a gazillion gallons of water and, and there, there's, the fish have dilution on their side. And um, when you put fish in a glass box, I mean, it's only so much water volume and they can't really get away from the parasites, you know, like they can in the ocean. And uh, if you've noticed, it seems to be people with larger tanks seem to be able to manage diseases better than smaller tanks. Well, they've got more water volume, um, you know, working in their favor. Some people will use like a UV sterilizer, which, you know, will remove from the free swimmers. The same thing, it's, it's, you're, you're creating dilution. As long as it's not, the parasites are below sublethal, your, your fish and you feed them well and their immune systems are, you know, the fish are healthy. The fish are gonna be able to, to beat the parasites themselves. It's when the fish's immune systems become compromised or there's too many parasites in the water for the fish to deal with, that's really when all hell breaks loose. So, Great, thank uh, you. Um, just following up on that, uh, Bobby, so if the temperature, you're saying we increase the temperature, which theoretically means it also kind of like speeds up the parasite from multiplying fast, right? Yes. And uh, when it consider marine velvet, it is also a dyna dinoflagellate. So we, we have known that it can actually kind of like just be photosynthesis and can actually be alive, right? So it, would that mean that if I keep a fallow and increase the temperature, my, if I'm having marine velvet, I'm, it's multiplying fast and I have say corals in the tank and I'm actually feeding it with light. So does that actually cause a problem? So the, the six weeks fallow period actually takes um, light into, into consideration. So if you were able, let's just say you were able to turn off light in, in your tank, which you could only do if you had a fowler, then probably I would say the, the fallow period for velvet would only be probably about three weeks. But because we're, we're taking that into consideration, um, that, that you know, being that velvet is a dinoflagellate, it uses light, um, every fallow period is worst case scenario. So that's, it, it, it's six weeks. Now I will say this, there is, and I need to do some more research, there has actually been um, some recent research about that even though velvet is a dinoflagellate, it may not be capable of photosynthesis. And that's not something I'm sure about right now. I mean, I've been saying for years that it is, and I've kind of uh, seen some information lately which is making me question that. So that's something I definitely have to go back and research to be sure about. I'm all, look, I'm, I'm, I don't think I know everything. I'm always learning something new. Sometimes I'm wrong and I have to do more research and, and, and find that I am wrong and then correct my information with more accurate information. Um, so that's one of those things I'm not 100% sure anymore if velvet is the type of dinoflagellate that can utilize photosynthesis because not all can. There, there are some that can, there are some that cannot. I just assumed because it was a dinoflagellate that it could, but I've seen some evidence lately that maybe that's not true. Okay, and the six weeks is uh, kind of like uh, just to support in case if it is photosynthesis, even then the six weeks is a good period for it to get rid of. Yes, yeah, if, if you go six weeks fallow and you eliminate any hypoxic regions of your tank, um, the only pathogen that can survive that would be uranema. No other pathogens can survive that long with or without light, without uh, a fish host to feed on. Perfect, thank you. Hey, Bobby, if you've got a tank that's running and a tank that has a hypoxic region, how likely is it that ick in the tank gets to the hypoxic region? I'm, it, it's kind of impossible to say, I would say. So basically, it, it, would, it would be a situation like this. So basically, you have um, protomons, you have the, the trophons fall off the fish and there's protomons and they crawl around for about, you know, 18 hours and they're looking for um, a suitable place to insist on. Um, now let's just say some hit the sand and they decide to start going into the sand bed um, for whatever reason. And they get deep enough into the sand bed where they're actually, they've encountered a hypoxic region or you know they could crawl in between the middle of a rock and literally they just go to sleep, they go dormant. Um, what are the odds of that happening? I, I really don't know. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if that's something a strategy. I wouldn't want to say it's a strategy they employ to ensure their survival. I think it's just one of those things. It's sort of happenstance. It just kind of happens, you know, you're in the right place at the right time and you go to sleep and you, you survive. You don't need to. Right. Say that again. 
Like if you had like shrimps and stuff, then they could like move things around, cover them up. Yeah, or like my wife is saying too, like, you know, well, it could be a situation where you have um, a protomont that's actually on the sand and let's just say a snail, uh, a Nasaria snail comes out of the sand and, and covers them up, you know, just it's just that kind of a situation or a snail or a shrimp moves something around. It could just be something like that that causes them. Or here's another one. Maybe they actually get, they hop on an Asaria snail shell. The snail burrows into the sand and they don't actually insist upon the shell. They get off once they're they're down deep in the sand bed, it could just be something like that that happens, just kind of a, you know, a fluke, yeah. W would you suggest like stirring your sand if you are fallow, um, like to an extent trying to like free that up? I would, I would just be careful because if you have a deep sand bed, you know, there's always that possibility right. of hitting a sulfur pocket. Um, so I'd hate to tell somebody to do that. And next thing you know, you know, the, the tank is smelling like rotten eggs. So, um, I mean, if you have like a, we'll say a two inch sand bed or something, that's not going to happen. But if you're one of these people that's, and I don't think too many people do it anymore. If you've got like a five, six inch sand bed, I don't really know how to tell you to proceed because there's, there's, there's a possibility you could hit a sulfur pocket in that sand bed, release sulfur into the water. And I mean, literally nuke your tank. So for people with deep sand beds, I don't know what to tell you to do, to be honest. Yeah, I've, I've got a yellow chorus rest that I'm firmly believing that nothing in the sand bed lives. Like it will not allow anything down that way. So I, I, I think a yellow, the yellow chorus rest kind of kills all, all, all ick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's, that would be good to have you if you have a sand burrowing rest or maybe a goby, like a diamond goby or something or a bella goby that's, that's constantly stirring up the sand. Um, yeah, that would be very useful to have during, well, of course you can't have it during a fallow period because it's a fish. I didn't forget about that. Nasaria right. snails would probably be great. I mean, if you had Nasaria snails during a fallow period, I mean, they're constantly like moving through the sand, stirring things up, churning the sand. So that would be a good critter to have during a fallow period. So, hey, Bobby, you mentioned, uh, UV sterilizer, sterilizers. Mm -hmm. Does the flow rate, uh, for those matter? Yes, absolutely. So, so most UV sterilizers will have two different flow rates. There's, there's one flow rate, a faster flow rate um, for killing algae spores to keep the water clean. And if you're, you're battling nuisance algae and you're trying to limit its transmission, then you, would run, you could run at that, that higher flow rate. There is a lower flow rate um, for killing pathogens, for, care, for killing free swimming parasites like ick and velvet and other pathogens, bacteria in the water. And um, I mean, every UV sterilizer you buy will come with instructions or a manual and they'll give you those two different flow rates. They'll give you one flow rate for um, algae and they'll give you a lower, a slower flow rate for parasites, bacteria, viruses. So you definitely want to run your UV sterilizer at that lower flow rate, um, which I think for most, I mean, it depends on the size of it, but I think it's between usually three to 400 gallons per hour is depending on how, whether it's like, you know, five inches or three inches, how thick um, the lamp, how big the lamps are. But I think it's usually between three and five, three to 400 gallons per hour is the kill um, flow rate for UV sterilizers. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So I have a yellow tang that um, had ick and then I, I used, you know, Nori and Celcon and, you know, it took care of it and it's been healthy. Are you saying that ick is forever in that tank now? So like, I haven't seen it for a while, but if I quarantine a fish and put it in there and you know, it was attacked or stressed, it could still come up with ick. Like, is it just in that tank forever now or? It, it's impossible to say because, um, so basically what happens is when it, we'll just say ick. So when, it, when your yellow tang was exposed to ick, um, basically it sounds like he was able to beat it himself. So what happened was, was his immune system developed enough proteins that were then released into his slime coat where he now has either a resistance or immunity to ick. So that one fish has immunity. Now, the, the million dollar question is, when, when, you, when ick was in your tank, are there still maybe some fish that maybe have one or two trophons? Like, because what happens with a lot of these parasites, including ick, is they always will feed in the gills before they make it on. Usually you don't see ick on a fish's skin unless there's a heavy infestation. But a lot of fish will have, um, carry like a sublethal concentration of ick, which is usually inside their gills. There'll be one or two trophants. 
that are feeding in the gills. And as long as one or two, two trophonts are feeding in the gills, the parasite is able to continue its life cycle. So what could happen in your situation is, even though the yellow tang or maybe the other fish in the tank beat ick, when you introduce a new, a new fish that may not have immunity to ick, they will be more susceptible to it and you could lose the fish or you will see more symptoms on that fish that you're gonna see in your yellow tang. So it's kind of like, I mean, a fish's immune system works a lot like our own. The more familiar we are with a pathogen, we build up, uh, unless we have an immunodeficiency, um, the fish builds up an immunity to it and the parasite is less likely to um, be successful in, in feeding on the fish or sometimes the fish is able to just, you know, maybe just one or two trophons is kept at a sublethal concentration. But when you add a new fish, there is a possibility um, that that fish does not have immunity and will be more susceptible. What you can do to test it is you can get some freshwater black mollies because freshwater black mollies have no immunity, no resistance to saltwater pathogens. You can slowly convert them over to full saltwater, put them in your tank, watch them for two to four weeks. If in two to four weeks they're clear, I'd say you don't have it in your tank. If you're seeing white dots on the black mollies within two to four weeks, then you do have it in your tank. So at least you kind of know moving forward, you know, what to expect when you add a new fish. So it can still go away even if you don't go fallow. It can, yeah. I mean, it's what are the odds? I don't know, but it, yeah, technically, if all of the fish in your tank, if their immune systems are able to to successfully, like the the when the free swimmers are in the water, their immune systems are so heightened that the that the parasites are not able to penetrate and not able to form trophonts, it's going to die off because the free swimmers were not able to feed, which in, in essence the starves the parasites to death. And what are the odds of that? I really don't know. I mean, because you know, I've heard the same thing. I've seen people say that you know, I just treated it with garlic or, or I fed well, it went away, it doesn't come back. And then I've seen people say, well, then a year or so later, I added a new fish and it did come back. Um, so it's just, it's just impossible to really say, but that's kind of why I like using black mollies as canary fish, if you will, because they're excellent for, for kind of disease detection in the tank to know if you've got something in a tank or not. It's what, it's what public aquariums do. They actually will put like black mollies, if there's a tank they're unsure about, they'll put black mollies like in, a, in an acclimation box inside of an, an aquarium, watch them for two to four weeks and see if the mollies hit for disease or not. Thanks. You're welcome. Bobby, I was just gonna ask about that and you hit on it, but you know, you cannot reuse mollies, right? Is that, is that my understanding? So if, if the mollies, so if you're using mollies for disease detection, um, as long as they don't, they don't, what I say, hit positive for disease, you never see a disease on them, then yeah, you can use them indefinitely because that tells you that their immune system has not been um, exposed to a saltwater pathogen. But once you do, the first time you ever see white dots on a molly and you're like, oh, there's ick, there's velvet, then um, for, for using them as a canary fish, they're now useless to you because now that their immune systems do have familiarity, or they're familiar with ick or velvet or whatever pathogen that they pop positive for, you have to assume that just like any other fish that they could develop immunity or resistance and they could fail you in the future as a canary fish. So what I tell people in that situation is obviously treat them. I mean, they're, they're still live fish, you know, treat them as you would your other fish or what you can do is quickly convert them back to fresh water, which you can do in like a matter of hours. And that being back in fresh water will kill the parasites on them. And then you can put them in your fresh water tank or give them to somebody with a fresh water tank, but they're no longer suitable to use as a canary fish once they've, um, they've shown that they you know, have a disease. And, and Bobby, I think the, the biggest thing, which I think is the challenge for the most of us is it's not actually quarantining the fish. It's quarantining everything else that goes into the tank, right? So right. snails, corals, you know, this guy gave me this, this girl gave me that, right? It's like, I think I've asked you about a thousand questions and I'm hoping for a different answer, but I always get the same answer. Like 76 days of a coral quarantine is just, you know, so stressful for me, frankly, to have to set up a second tank with good parameters for this and that. But even just to talk a little bit about, you know, not just the fish aspect of it, but how else you could introduce ick, velvet, other things to your tank through different means. Right, yeah, so I mean, um, 
and I've got again on my on my uh, forum, I've got like a whole list of everything that's ever been tested. It was in 1992, Dr. Peter Burgess actually did a study on this and he he basically studied all the different materials that protomonts could insist upon to form tomonts. And there were things like glass and shell material. Um, there were staghorn corals. There were a lot of different things that he used. So yeah, unfortunately the vast, anything that's got a hard surface to it. So, I mean, LPS corals all have that a stony base. Um, most, a lot of soft corals will come on a rock. Uh, snails, hermit crabs have a, um, you know, obviously like a, a shell. Um, crustaceans have an exoskeleton that are hard. So unfortunately, all of those you should quarantine in a fishless system. Now you, you can, in the fishless, uh, I call my fish, fishless frag tank, if you will, you can uh, increase temperature to 80.6 degrees Fahrenheit and that will shorten the fallow period in there for to six weeks, just like you could in your DT. But unfortunately, I can't tell you how many times, you know, someone's like, I have velvet, what happened? I haven't added a, added a fish recently. And then once we start talking about it, well, they just got uh, some snails in from, from somewhere. And yep. I'm like, well, that's probably, that was the, um, you know, the, the gateway. That's, that's what introduced it into your tank because the, the tomons can insist upon their shells. If you add a coral frag, um, SPS are generally safe unless um, there's a bleach spot on it. But I mean, tomons cannot insist upon live tissue. So SPS are kind of safe. What I tell people to minimize the chance is to um, take it off its plug and glue it onto a new plug um, because the plugs are an excellent, it's an excellent vector for parasites to insist upon a coral plug and, and get in your tank. Um, that way. But uh, the safe thing to do, unfortunately, is to put all corals inverts in a fishless frag tank for, for six weeks and, and increase the temperature to 80.6 degrees Fahrenheit and wait it out. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of popping them right off the plug on, on an SPS standpoint. Um, mm -hmm. if, it, if it's cool with Paul, I mean, I, I'd love to hear a little bit about your Humble Fish approved vendors because I've used them uh, for a lot of different purposes, but I think if we're all looking to kind of keep a QT tank, keep something clean, it's like you've got a list of vendors that you used and have vetted that, you know, kind of supply these different types of things already QT'd, QT'd available to drop right in the tanks. Right, so on my forum, uh, there is a, uh, a list of quarantine vendors. I only allow, um, we only have livestock vendors on my forum and the only livestock vendors I allow or ones that quarantine all their livestock and they've all been vetted by me. So basically, uh, it's been a couple of years now, I was running my own um, quarantine fish business and I was the only one, well, at least on my form, I was the only one doing it. And I uh, decided to take a break because I wanted to do more experimentation. So then there was other people popping up, you know, that, that wanted to do it, get in the game. So there are people I know like Mike, uh, Dr. Reef is a good friend of mine. and. Uh, um, he uses my, um, my, my quarantine protocols and there's some others. There's, uh, they're actually kind of spaced out all over. We got one in Los Angeles, one in Minnesota, one in New Jersey, one in Florida. But all of these vendors that are on my forum are vendors either, some of them I've either trained myself or at the very least they've been vetted by me. And I'm, I'm comfortable with that their quarantine protocols are thorough enough where I feel comfortable that if you buy fish from them, you're not going to get a disease in your tank. Because quite frankly, if you do, it damages my reputation. Because then it's like, I bought a, a fish with a disease and Humble Fish recommended this guy and, you know, let me down. So I, 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 I police it. Um, I'm really hard on the vendors. I make sure um, that they're, they're doing what they say they're going to do. If, well, yeah, I'm not actually there to see them. Um, if we have problems with one, they they get removed from the forum because I'm just not going to put up with it. Um, and um, I guess I said, I mean, I put the hobbyist first. I mean, look, first and foremost, I'm a hobbyist. So I try to look out for my fellow hobbyists. And I kind of feel like that's a way that I can do that. And I look out for the fish by making sure that if you buy um, fish from a vendor on my forum, that it is truly a quarantine fish that you can just drop in your display tank. Yeah, I mean, that, that's great. I mean, I think I bought three tangs and, you know, I thought one might have had ick and you and I went back and forth. But at the end of the day, I think it might have been a little lympho at the end, but, you know, it worked out really well. And 
you know, I continue to use them. So, I mean, I think it's, it's great that they're vetted and providing this stuff. And again, to your point, I think it's awesome for the hobbyist to be able to have an avenue to get clean stuff coming into their tank, because at the end of the day, we all have thousands of dollars worth of fish in our tank and it only takes one, one fish to completely wipe all of that out. So, I mean, I appreciate that you do that. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it definitely, I mean, I kind of got sick of the whole uh, turn and burn aspect of the, of the industry where, I mean, they're just basically just moving these, these fish down the supply chain and maybe you get lucky, you buy a fish that has, doesn't have a disease. Maybe you do. And I just, I just, it was driving me nuts. So I decided I'm going to do something about it. And I did it for uh, a couple of years myself and then other uh, people that I knew, you know, wanted to do it. And I, um, I, I encouraged them. I, it's a tough business to be in because you're honestly, you don't really make any money. I mean, by the time you pay for all your overhead and your losses and all that, you're not really making any money, but um, the guys that are doing it are, they've got the passion that I have. They, they want to try to, to help make the hobby better. They want to help the fish and we really want to put pressure on the industry. I, I would love to see most, if not all retailers selling quarantine fish. And I'm hoping that if enough people are buying quarantine fish, that will put, pressure on others, other retailers to do the same because in order to compete, um, that's, that's actually been one of my goals from the beginning. Cause I mean, what we're doing now, this is, it's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, you know, you, you buy a fish and, um, can wipe everything out and thousands of dollars down the drain and people are getting, you know, quitting the hobby left and right. And, um, I'm just trying to find a way to, to help, to make that better, to just, to stop that. I have a quick question. Can you, can you guys hear me? Yep. <laughs> Sweet. Um, so obviously you can see in my picture there, that magnificent fox face. <laughs> so I, uh, I actually reached out, made my first post back in December on your forum. And uh, you sent me some information on how to treat ick, mm -hmm. uh, you know, eradication versus ick, man ick management. So my question is, so the fish is a lot better. I have a 40 watt UV sterilizer running. Well, just plumbed it in actually today. And, uh, but it's, you know, that was like extreme. Like I was heartbroken, you know, I spent a good, good chunk of money on it. You know, the, the place that I bought it, you know, swore to me up and down, you know, went up through a 30 day, uh, you know, 30 day quarantine and stuff like that. Now, my question is, where do I go from here? You know, do, when I add more fish to the system, do I, sh would I be better off, you know, saying going through, you know, one of those quarantine vendors or should I just, with, now with the UV sterilizer, should I just throw whatever in that tank? Um, so in your, in your specific case, I mean, no, you know, you have ache in the tank. Um, I, I personally probably wouldn't waste money on quarantine fish because you're going to be paying more, um, to buy fish to put in your tank that, I mean, you know, they're putting in possibly in a diseased environment. What I would do in your, your specific situation is I would buy fish and I would just put them in a holding tank without medications for two to four weeks. Um, watch the fish. Um, obviously, if you see signs of velvet or something like that, or brooker, you want to treat, if you see signs of ick, don't worry about it because I mean, the fish is already going to go into a system with ick anyway. Um, you definitely want to keep that UV running 24-7. Um, you want to change out the lamps every, I know back when I was using the UV sterilizer, you had to change the lamps every six months. Now I'm being told on some of the newer UV sterilizers that the lamps might be good for 12 to 18 months. I guess that's, uh, you know, every manufacturer has different recommendations, but you definitely want to uh, keep that UV going. You definitely want to keep up with changing the lamps out. Um, because that, that UV sterilizer, that is your savior right now. That, that could be with keeping, you know, your tank from a, a full outbreak. And, uh, yeah, the concern is like, and it's probably let, well, you guys get like winter storms up there. I know I'm from new Orleans. So my thing, when I was in ick management mode, my concern was every hurricane season, you know, am I going to lose power? And then, you know, when you lose power and, and then, you know, it stresses the fish out. And when you stress the fish out, it lowers their immune system, makes them more susceptible. Um, so in your particular case, you know, a generator would probably be a, a good idea. So if you have like a nor'easter or something blow through, you lose power, you could uh, keep running that UV sterilizer even with the, with the power is off. 
But as far as buying new fish, I would um, definitely buy regular fish, observe them for two to four weeks, treat if needed, um, but probably not worth it in your situation to buy quarantine fish, not worth okay. the extra money you would spend. Well, thanks. Yeah, I like to live uh, live on the edge here. My, my town's infrastructure is from like the 1700s and no generator here. That's the next big purchase. I keep mm -hmm. telling myself that, but seem to spend more money on just random crap for the tank. And one of these well, days I'll learn. In the meanwhile, a, uh, you know, air pump, you know, I mean, you can just buy a battery powered air pump that, that can help yeah. and you at least would provide the tank with oxygen. Um, it sounds a little cheeky, but uh, I know people that actually will take like a power inverter and, you know, run their car and run a power yeah. inverter, run a cord into the tank. And at least you could, you could run one wave maker. You can maybe run your heater to keep the temperature uh, stable. Sure. Um, I mean, any little thing you can do to buy yourself more time, you know, you want to keep two things. You want to um, oxygen, keep as much oxygen in the water as possible, and you want to control the temperature as much as you possibly can until you possibly get the, the power restored. Because, I mean, um, I mean, I've been in situations where I was without power for, you know, a week or more, but just being able to um, keep the, uh, an air pump going to provide oxygen in the water, um, I was constantly like it was in the summer, so I was using like ice packs in the tank to keep the temperature under control, and I didn't really lose that many fish. So every little nice. bit helped. Cool. Hey, hey, Bobby. One question. You know, when it, when it comes to food, you know, I um, only fish I've ever lost was a pot of blue tang to ick on my old tank when Hurricane Sandy came up, and uh, I used to live in Thibodeau, Louisiana. You know, a little bit, right. little, little bit, little bit, little bit west of where y'all were, but I used to go to Nickel State. Oh, Nickel State. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. All day, yeah. So, um, you know, different world there. So, you know, we don't deal with hurricanes that much. But, like, from a food standpoint, my question is, like, I hear a lot of people talk about garlic and talk about this and talk about that. Like, what is your take on kind of nutrition with a fish? So, okay, so first we'll talk about garlic. So, you know, I don't really know if garlic is, is beneficial or not. I mean, it's possible garlic has um, is beneficial because um, it, it, it is an appetite stimulant. So you know if you you soak the food in garlic, it makes the fish eat more. If the fish eat more, it, it, it heightens their immune system. Uh, there is actually evidence that that garlic does kill bacteria. So it, it maybe maybe it kills parasites, maybe it doesn't. I just have a little theory about garlic. If you've ever noticed somebody that um, eats a lot of garlic, like a, a human, um, the you actually can smell Dink. it. Yeah, it, it, it actually leaches out of their pores. So I kind of wonder sometimes if by fish eating garlic and it leaches out of their pores, it makes them an undesirable host. The parasites, the trophons don't want to feed on them because they don't like the taste of, of garlic on them. Um, but garlic non, notwithstanding, um, I'm a big advocate in using uh, vitamin, su vitamin supplements, uh, vitamin C. Um, there, there's a whole if you buy some of these products like Cellcon and Zocone and Vitacam, I mean, there's all kinds of vitamins in those. You can actually uh, soak the food um, with, with vitamins. Um, there is, uh, yeah, so when that, my wife's reminding me of things as we're, we're doing this, but so basically like fish in the ocean eat meat, they eat seafood. Um, you know, a lot of people like to eat flakes, uh, feed flakes and fleet, uh, feed pellets. And I mean, I think that's fine, but I think it's really important to do proper nutrition. And what I mean by that is you want to feed your fish things like, you know, scallops and clams and, and shrimp and things that they would be eating in the ocean, because these are things that, you know, that actually promote healthy gut flora that actually is, is where their immune system is derived from. Um, so it's really important not just to feed, you know, flake and pellets. You want to feed uh, frozen food. You want to feed mice and shrimp. You want to feed live foods if possible, live black worms, live white worms, anything that contains live bacteria, which will, um, you know, promote healthy gut flora, which will enhance their immune system. I'm also a big fan of LRS foods because he yeah. soaks the food in probiotics. So especially when you treated uh, a fish with copper, and if the copper does kill some of the gut um, flora, then the probiotics help to repair it. Just kind of like when we take antibiotics, that can damage our, our uh, healthy bacteria in the gut. So I, I guess what I'm saying is feed frozen food. If you, if you don't want to, you know, buy LRS, you can make your own. I mean, you know, you guys probably have access, like I do, you know, living in Florida to seafood. You can buy clams and mussels and scallops and 
shrimp and you can make your own frozen food concoction to feed to your fish. You wanna soak vitamins in it and you wanna soak probiotics in it. Um, and going back to beta-glucan is another one. Beta-glucan is an excellent, um, it, it stimulates the fish's appetite and it also enhances their immune system. And it's something you can just buy on Amazon and you can make it yourself. Actually on my forum, there's a guy here that he makes his own little uh, uh, frozen food stuff and sells it. And he actually let me like repost the recipe on the forum. So that's there. Um, if anybody wants to use it and make their own frozen food. But. Yeah, I saw that recipe. It's pretty, pretty wild with what's in there. But I just spent 300 bucks for uh, on premium aquatics for like Calanus and LRS and stuff. So I got a big, a big stash of that. Got some beta glucan as well, you know, as needed. Um, I think I saw somewhere you had posted one time about like clams, like in mussels, like needing to freeze them for like 24 hours mm -hmm. before you use them. Kind of what is the risk of using them straight out, like right from the grocery store? So I would be worried because they have shells, because I like to feed them in the shell. I mean, I guess you could just dig out the meat and do it that way, but I actually kind of like to, you know, like we'll just say a clam or a muzzle. I like to actually put the shell on the bottom and, and especially if you have butterfly fish or angels, like let them actually eat out of the shell like they would in nature. Um, but the danger is that on the shells, the shells could have toe mounts because again, it's, it's, it's a shell. So what I do is um, when I buy clams or muzzles or really any seafood, um, I always freeze it um, for 24 hours before I use it. Um, and you're still going to get the benefit from it because, I mean, you're not going to kill the bacteria. You can't, freezing doesn't kill bacteria or viruses. So you're still going to get that, that, that good, healthy bacteria that the fish need uh, to promote um, their health by freezing. But, I mean, you buy them, just put them in a Ziploc bag, freeze them for 24 hours, and they're good to go. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Robbie. Uh, quick question on um, on the marine in the fish industry. Have you seen any um, increase with seeing um, tumors in fish? Uh, the reason for my question is, um, a year ago, I noticed that one of my Melanaris ras had actually a, a tumor. It started showing up on the gills. So well, slowly he was actually having difficulty breathing. I could see that actually the tumor actually grew. And then he, he, he probably kind of like uh, struggled with that for a week and then actually kind of like he passed, okay? When I dissected the, uh, the fish, I could see that it eroded most of actually the, of the tissue in the, in, the, in the gills all the way in the skull, okay? Mm -hmm. So I was actually thinking if that is actually due to anything that I'm dosing to the tank in terms of the corals, any additives that I'm adding. So wondering, have you seen any pattern of kind of like tumors actually kind of like showing up in fish? I haven't seen really an uptick in that. I mean, um, you do every now and then, you know, I'll encounter a fish that has either a malignant or a benign tumor. Um, and I mean, sometimes it's something, it's weird. Sometimes you can do a little fish operation and you can try to cut it off. Um, and then sometimes it just spreads like crazy and, and, and kills the fish. Um, the only things I could think of that the, the fish industry could be doing to increase the likelihood of encountering a tumor on a fish is, um, so formalin is kind of uh, gaining traction again. You know, a lot of, of, of um, I can tell you a lot of wholesalers are using formalin in their systems. They're actually, what they're doing is they're using copper and formalin. I do use formalin sometimes. I'm not a fan of it because it is a, it is a known carcinogen and it has been proven to cause uh, cancer in humans. Um, of course, there's no such studies linking um, formalin to cancer in fish because, you know, fish, I guess, they're not important enough to do studies on, those kind of studies on. But it seems logical to me that if formaldehyde formalin can cause cancer in humans, it probably can cause uh, cancer in fish as well. So that's one possibility that because of the use of formalin um, and that's sort of gaining traction, again, I know more and more wholesalers are doing that to um, um, you know, kind of control diseases in, in their, their wholesale facilities, um, that would definitely could cause more cancerous tumors in fish. And like I said, there's more, I do advise some um, people in the industry, including wholesalers, and, you know, they'll kind of bounce ideas off me and I give them, you know, my recommendations. This is what I would do, yada, yada, yada. But I, I do see a lot of them come back to me and say, well, I think we're just going to run copper and formalin on all the fish because that will control uh, most of the parasites that pass through the facility. So 
that's possible. Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I just saw um, a vlog uh, from uh, one of actually a coral farms. Um, they, they were actually kind of like suggesting using formalin as actually the preferred method to um, uh, during the quarantine. Uh, yeah, yeah, interesting perspective. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's and that's kind of becoming. I mean, it's weird because that is the way it used to be done. You know, I mean, when you when you mix copper and formalin, they actually they, they mix well together and, you know, copper treats ick and velvet and formalin treats brook and uranema and flukes. And so it's kind of like they complement one another in a way because what one does, the other doesn't and vice versa. I mean, it's when you combine them, it's more of a, um, a comprehensive treatment. And it was something that was sort of done in the 80s. And then it, it kind of went away. And now I'm kind of seeing a resurgence of both wholesalers and retailers wanting to go back to, you know, combining copper and formalin to either uh, quarantine the fish or just to, to, to control diseases. Um, and I don't really think it's a good thing because I, I don't like using formalin because of its, you know, the, the fumes and everything. Um, but I mean, I, I guess it is what it is. I mean, they're going to do what they got to do. So um, that's possible. That could be the reason why you're seeing more tumors is because of increased formalin use. Thank you. You're welcome. Come on, guys. I can go all night. More questions. <laughs> I mean, it's 841. I mean, oh. geez, it's, uh, you know, we, we've gone wonderful. But, you know, what, what a good time to catch New England fans when uh, the Patriots are in the playoffs on, on a playoff weekend. So, hey, but the Bills are playing right now, but y'all probably hate the Bills, I'm guessing, right? I mean, I, I, I forgot who was playing right now. I'm a Steelers fan, so, <laughs> God, screw me. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> um, it doesn't work out at all. But, um no, I mean, I, I've, you know, I, I, I've asked a lot of my questions and, uh, you know, appreciate, appreciate your time. Appreciate you on this, on this call. You're welcome. I've enjoyed it. Thanks for you, Paul. 100% oh, yeah? quarantine. He's just too big for my tank. How big's too big? I don't know, man. That SOB is like seven inches, man. He's big. Yeah, it's probably too big for mine, too. I know. I know. He's, uh, he was the first one in my 150 and he's a monster. He's nice. big and he's fat. Yeah. Hot. yeah, yeah, but, but you saw him, dude. He's he's yeah. fat, dude. You could fillet him, frankly. <laughs> Awful. He's got. Yeah, they stop. do get pretty. They do get pretty fat. Yeah, but I feel like he he keeps my tangs in check, so I I, I kind of hate to get rid of him, but he's getting big. So you know, interestingly enough, and I've probably gone on and on too much, but so rabbit fish actually, they did a study in rabbit fish actually uh, release a serum into their mucus coat, which specifically kills ictrophons. And it's the first fish that I've ever heard that actually specifically has that capability. Well, Bobby, they smoke off. I don't know if you ever watched it, but they, mm -hmm. they kind of, they, they just, they, they, they go into the smoke and this whole mist comes off of them. And I mean, he's this clean, I mean, he's never, I mean, all of my fish have been QT, but I mean, he's, he's got this, well, so he, he sheds the skin. Yeah, he and sheds it just, his mucus coat. It, it goes yeah. right away, and he's as clean as a whistle right after that. So I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably it's the the proteins um, building up in the mucus coat. Look I got a I got a fox. Much it just basically he basically sheds it, um, kind of like a rasp does. You know, like a, yeah. a farrier or a flasher rasp can do. You know, they they shed their um, um, their slime coat after they sleep in their cocoon yeah, at night. Each night, my, my lineatus, lineatus, I don't know how you would pronounce that, but uh, yeah, I, I see that stuck to a coral every, every morning. Yeah, see, he does that, yeah. So that's interesting. So it's kind of like, well, if you know you have it in your tank and you don't want to quarantine and you're like, well, well then I would say also your strategy should be on your fish selection. So a, a tank, fish that are, that are just more disease resistant than others you know obviously tangs are notorious for being you know people like to say they're ick magnets so that maybe not would be a good choice but wrasses are extremely uh resistant to diseases um clownfish except for brook uh foxface rabbit fish are usually pretty resistant to diseases uh, mandarins are um i mean it's almost i'm not saying it's impossible for them to get ick, but I mean, highly unlikely because they have a very, any fish that have a thick mucus or slime coat are going to have um, more natural defenses against parasites and worms and bacteria than fish with a, with a thin slime coat. So like a fish like a, 
an angelfish or a butterfly or a tang, those fish have thin slime coats. Whereas fish with thick slime coats, thick mucus coats are gonna have more natural defenses. They're better candidates for what I call an ick management tank. Um, just something to keep in mind. But that's just it though, Bobby, right? So you're, I mean, you still want to quarantine them for six weeks for like velvet and such, right? Right. Yeah. Cause I mean, yeah. you know, if you know you have ick in your tank, I mean, I don't, I get some flack for saying this because people are like, oh, you should tell people they have to, you know, worry about all diseases. But realistically speaking, I don't really worry about ick that much. I worry more about velvet, brook, uranema, stuff like that. But yeah, you definitely want to at least quarantine for two to four weeks and at the very minimum observe the fish to be sure that they don't have velvet or one of those more virulent pathogens that you don't want in your tank because whereas it can be managed velvet is a whole different ball game and i'm not saying velvet can't be managed i mean there are people that do manage velvet but it is a lot more difficult to do than than ick so here i for uh, 30 minutes in the hydrogen peroxide yep. before the observes. Yeah, my wife, and it's a good suggestion. So because we know that hydrogen peroxide has efficacy against uh, things like velvet and brook and some of these They're other diseases, interested. but we know that we don't think that uh, hydrogen peroxide necessarily works against ick because again, it burrows in. Then the, the gentleman that was, um, um, that was speaking that, you know, he's got ick in his tank and he's like, what do I do? Do I buy quarantine fish? I would highly recommend um, maybe before the fish goes into observation and also before the fish goes into the display tank to do a 30 minute hydrogen peroxide bath because that will knock off the worst pathogens and all you're left with are things like maybe it got through, maybe flukes got through, but these are things that you can, you can manage in your DT. So the peroxide is a, is a great, a 30 minute peroxide bath is a great uh, uh, one to use, a great bath to use if you're just trying to knock off the worst pathogens, but not necessarily you want to do like a full quarantine, if that makes sense. So yeah, with that oxygen, I mean, uh, with the hydrogen peroxide, is there any, is just regular everyday peroxide? Yep, it's basically 3% hydrogen peroxide that you can buy from Walmart or any drugs. I mean, there's on my website, there's directions on step-by-step -step how to use it. I prefer to use um, glass because glass is inert. inert. Um, you can use food grade plastic. I mean, that's fine as well. I just would not use like a cheap plastic bucket. You know, if you're going to use plastic, use a food grade plastic bucket. Um, you do, you know, two, three gallons of water. Uh, make sure that the water is, is fully been oxygenated, you know, before you use it. Because once you dose the peroxide, I recommend discontinuing all aeration so it doesn't break down the peroxide. Um, you basically dose it in the water. You gently stir it with a spoon and put the fish in it for 30 minutes and that should knock off the very worst pathogens that the fish has. I don't think it's, it's a, not, one peroxide bath is not 100% effective against everything, but it will knock off the worst pathogens. That's what my research has, uh, has found so far. And then my wife's saying observe afterwards. But I, look, I realistically, I know people aren't, some people are gonna do this. Some people will do that and some people are like, hey, I'm just going to buy a fish and I'm going to do a 30 minute peroxide bath and I'm putting that puppy in my DT. And if that's what you're going to do, that's fine. It's just, it's, it's, it's a, it's a layer of defense to do before you, you add the fish either to a holding tank or directly into your personal questions. I mean, thankfully Brian and everyone else is, and yourself obviously has made this very interesting. I sent you a message on a uh, Facebook chat there and, uh, I, I, I never really gave any thought to fish disease or, you know, if a fish died, a fish died or anything like that. But um, it's definitely piqued in interest. I could see where, you know, where this could go. I'll have to spend a little more time on your forum. But I greatly do appreciate it. I'll tell you, Paul, I, I've got about $16,000 invested in my tank and all my wife cares about is the fish. So I'm yeah. just like, Jesus, it's like, you know, I spent a thousand dollars on all the fish and the rest of it is just like, you know, it, it I, I think Bobby's been a life send to me in, in, in terms of all of the things that we've done and short of the, the booty rest that I lost at one point in time, I um, mean, everything else has been great. So, I mean, you know, I followed his advice in a lot of different places and it's worked out well and, you know, appreciate him and appreciate kind of Boston Reef for setting this up. And I mean, I think the more and more all of us can kind of get on board to having those healthy type tanks, the better it is to kind of cross pollinate across aquaculture 
corals and fish and whatnot. It's great. Yeah, and I want to just I want to just stress too, really quick that you know if you come on my forum and ask questions, look, we got we have people on my forum that are are like me and they quarantine everything. And there's some people that don't that that just do management. They don't quarantine anything. So I don't want people to ever think you're going to come on my forum and get beat up because you don't quarantine. It doesn't work like that. If you come on my forum and say, look, I, I've got these fish are sick. How do I quarantine? We're going to help you do that. If you come on and say, look, I can't quarantine. I got to deal with this in the DT with corals and inverts. Can you help me with that? we can help you with that too. Um, so whatever your situation is, if you quarantine, you don't quarantine, whatever you wanna do, I, I think we've got people on my forum that can help you come up with a game plan for your specific situation. Awesome. Does anybody else have any uh, questions for Mr. Bobby here? All right, Bobby, like I said, um, greatly appreciate you coming on the stream. Uh, we do really appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Good to be here. I did send you a message. If you could get back to me at some point or, you know, I'll reach out to you in a couple of weeks and uh, we can go from there. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks again, Humble Fish. Have a wonderful night. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bobby. Take care. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks, appreciate Paul. it. Take care. All right. Bye. Thank you. Very good information.